I am a living example of personal publishing empowerment. As I sat down to frame this talk, I realized I have a pretty bleak message for large-scale publishers. Mass media requires passivity while the net resoundingly rejects it. This technology promotes decentralization, force-feeding the net public Force-feeding the net public, heaping spoonfuls of what you think is tasty will fail, even if people have a choice of spoons. People want to talk to each other. If they are going to read something, they want it to be vibrant and heartfelt. Even now, large media has a hard time with both of those. In the future, on the net, they will go, grow lifeless and useless faster than ever. Besides writing for high school publications, my first sizable publishing experience was completely self-driven. In January 94, I checked out the World Wide Web, the coolest thing I'd ever seen on computers. I quickly took my stories, poems, reviews, net surfing impressions, and put them all online. Soon I had my own magazine with a daily readership in the thousands. Over time, my site has evolved to encompass my interests and in response to the feedback I've received from the community. I provide tours of the net, buy subject site surveys from sex and drugs to Native American nets and scientific art. Each of these links is a point of exit, but ultimately it's about building the web. I appreciate other people's efforts and obligingly link to them. Each subject page is a focal point for a specific community of interest. As a part of that community, I am in turn mentioned on other relevant pages, each of which is a point of entry back to my web world. As soon as people began visiting my site, they were asking questions. How do you send your text? How do you do those images? People are excited and inspired by my example and want to get involved. So I designed tutorials. There are some people who can stand about 10 minutes of the web before they are itching to try it themselves. Offering them ease of access and understanding further broadens the web. There's nothing like watching an untapped publisher get their hands on the medium. They go crazy and I can never keep up. Recently, I've been into storytelling, specifically autobiographical. I have individual pages devoted to my friends and family with links to their pages if they have them. If everyone was to tell their stories on the web, we would have an endless human storybook with alternating perspectives. It would be content provision, but on a personal level, a distinctly human scale. So if you think about it. OK. I actually have a related problem, seeing people as websites. <laughs> when I meet someone, I, I think I'm a journalist in this way, when I meet someone I try and draw out their story. I found in this pursuit that everyone has a story. Imagine, I like to imagine if they were all online, linked together, a big never-ending human storybook. Like when I meet big honchos, important people involved in the web, I ask them if they have a web page and they point me at their magazine. I don't really care about the magazine's top five hot sites for the week. I want to know what that guy thinks is cool. How did he get to be on top, and who's there with him? Tell me about yourselves, otherwise I'm going to get bored and look for someone who's telling me something heartfelt, not something market-driven. I used my zine to secure myself a job in the online division of Wired magazine. I arrived at Wired just in time to join them in attempting what they called new thinking for a new medium, hot wired. An impressive array of creative minds were granted use of impressive resources to build an online community that would take the web by storm. Instead of innovation and invention, political wrangling over creative control deadlines and money meant that we ended up with old thinking for a new medium. <laughs> Rather than allowing the technology and creativity to run their course, the emphasis was on tracking users for sponsorship and adhering to, adhering to a rigidity at odds with the net. Hotwired is the magazine model ported online with minimal allowance made for user interaction. Whatever you've heard about the net, that ain't it. People want to muck around. Hotwired is still trying to tell the net at large what is cool, while its user registration and adherence to obscure design principles prevent the free flow of information. I won't deny its market niche, but ultimately Hotwired falls short. Of course, they get hundreds of thousands of hits daily, and we're making advertiser money from day one. But the magazine itself is inconsequential. People don't link from their pages to hot-wired content. They link to reputation. This is Wired Magazine's website, not, hey, wow, check out the cool stuff on Hotwired. People don't, on the net don't talk about what's in Hotwired, and I'll bet when the next large ma net magazine comes around, there really won't be any reason to remember your Hotwired username and password. 
personal web pages merge content provision and human connection. I'm telling stories, but they're human, and ultimately for my own satisfaction. This is the journalism of the future. Give someone a digital camera, a laptop, and a cellular phone, and you've got an on-the-spot multimedia storyteller from anywhere in the world. And one of those fancy little uh, glucose trackers. You know, they're <laughs> you can know what they're spending their money on. Let's see. The need for staff and overhead has been drastically reduced. The primacy of placement, the, immedi the immediacy of the story is mandatory. What's the point of doing the same old in this new medium? Selling magazines? Big deal. The web has larger potential than just greater revenue and market share. When people can browse through a site in a matter of seconds and leave for an independent operator in a single bound, the rules are changed. Bridging the gap by relying on old systems creates undue burdens on both users and providers. Top-down publishing, trying to rein in people with exclusivity, registration, and proprietary technology is tantamount to fighting the net. Working with the net requires openness, unlimited content, ease of access, open standards, low overhead, independent producers. Of the two, working with the net makes for better websites and happier readers. It is increasingly difficult to entice a broad range of folks with a single publication. As we can see from our country's burgeoning magazine racks, the trend is toward niches, specializations. Attempt to design a killer apps, a net-wide unifying content force will only stifle creativity. People on the net see Microsoft this way and have made that company the butt of many a joke. Profits on the net won't come from mass market media. They will come from millions of minuscule fees per stories per story tributes to usefulness and pleasure. In this setting, the role for large publishers is empowerment. You can hire experts to predict the next great youth trend and build a magazine around it, or you can give some inspired young people computers and let them do their thing. The best content comes from people who love what they are doing. You can't hire experts to figure that out, but you can give resources to people who would do it anyway and share in the fruits of their labor. Large publishers then become media stables, places that provide the computers and net access for writers. The writers themselves provide the content and context, their point of view, and their area of specialization. Marketing is done through communities of interest. With the advent of digital cash, as Stephen Levy, in the Stephen Levy model, anyone can set up their own stories serving station, hundreds upon thousands of little self-sufficient magazines supported by communities of folks who care to share. If you can tell your stories and make money and have decent health care, why would you ever write for a large media organization? <laughs> Reporters will leave major media, set up their own content serving stations. People will be charging minuscule amounts of money to read each other's stories, and after a while we'll realize, hey, I like your writing. I like telling stories. That you would listen to me is flattery. I like your stories too, so let's trade. So we'll all forget about money, sit around and make art, and tell each other stories while computers handle all the problems of the world. Why not? Computers are already replacing people in those shitty Industrial Revolution jobs. People say, what are they going to do? Like there's a crisis. We've got to find something to keep the unemployed busy. What, are they, what, what should we have them do? How about dig some ditches? Why don't they make art of all the reasons to live and participate in society? Having a voice ranks far higher than performing manual labor at the bottom of the skill set. What's important is that a broad range of people have access to the technology. If the world is split into those that are wired and those that aren't, we will continue to walk the razor's edge of revolution and civil strife. If, on the other hand, we welcome the previously disenfranchised into the information age and give them a voice along with ours, we can use this technology to unite the world, not in vying for market share, but with stories and art celebrating the human experience. I think news is stories. It's just people telling other people's stories. They've been imbued with a certain sense of timeliness and urgency, and when they you know, affect our lives, they have a certain urgency. But when you t st take a step back and look at the paper yesterday and the paper today, just storytellers. Most reporters I meet, too, are usually pretty good storytellers. They have a term for the, the, the uh, people who, as you say, read what I want to read what I have to say. On the net, they call them lurkers, people who go through chat rooms and read news groups without contributing. And uh, of course, the 
as it is in this democracy, the largest uh, the largest group of people is the non-participating observers who haven't quite gotten the guts or the inspiration to do anything themselves, including messaging the author of whatever is currently occupying their time. Um, most of the, I so I would say that the vast majority of my readers come through for probably an average of five clicks and uh, go somewhere else. A lot of people come through and uh, do take the time to write me. I have uh, I haven't been able to harness the technical power of the web to provide interactive spaces for readers yet, but I have I have set up uh, areas on my web pages where I interact with my readers via collecting comments and advice page, and uh, you know of course taking submissions for all my stuff. I find that um, people respond the best. Well, I don't know. I just got, I checked my email last night from the hotel room and I got a message from, help, I'm 13 and I want to get on the web. And, uh, hi, my name is Aaron Bernhard. I'm a 13-year-old I'm in the middle of New York and I just got on the internet and I just found your page and I, and I just really want to get involved in, and what do I have to do? What do I have to buy? I, I, I'm, a, I'm a caddy so I have money so I can get involved. And... I don't know how many Aaron Bernhardts there are out there, but there's a pretty significant number, and I found the more Aaron Bernhardts I write to and tell them how to do it, the more they sort of network out and help the other uh, Aaron Bernhardts. <laughs>